fourth webinar in a oh Georgina, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome to our fourth um, in our series Desperate Romantics. Um, on this date in 1801, uh, Dorothy records the evening being piercing cold. Well, it, it is a it is a cold evening in Grasmere tonight. Um, William and Dorothy walked to Easdale. Uh, they gathered mosses, they fetched cream, and they spent what Dorothy calls a decent evening uh, with a neighbour, Mr. Olive, playing cards. So a special welcome, um, I guess a kind of virtual welcome to Grasmere, Rob, um, speaking to us from Canada this evening. Um, where is exactly in Canada? Um, right at the top of Lake Ontario. I'm in Ontario, it's just north of a town called Kingston, which has a university called Queen's where I work when I'm not in England at Bath Spa University. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm right, like when, when you see the St. Lawrence Seaway end and the Great Lakes begin, that's where I am. So you, sh you should have been in England at this time, shouldn't you? But I uh, should definitely, definitely, definitely be in England. But I am not. <laughs> I, am, I, I am here until we all get to the other side of the current crisis, which I hope uh, happens soon. Let's hope. We look forward to welcoming you. Uh, in person. Thank you. So tonight, tonight we're going to focus on the Regency years, um, and I think uh, when when the three of us talked earlier in the week, um, we agreed how fascinating it is just to focus on a few years. Um, and and as Rob said, it, it made the point that focusing on particular literary works in the context of the decade brought a kind of new meaning to them. In in the course of the evening, we're going to be looking at half a dozen works that feature in in the in Rob's book. Uh, we just thought it might be interesting to, to, to invite people who were part of this, that if you were going to nominate, say, half one of half a dozen books uh, that we you might expect us to highlight later on, uh, which would you nominate? Which would you expect to see in our in our kind of greatest hits of the Regency years? Um, my name is Jeff Cowton. Um, I'm curator and head of learning uh, at Words with Grasmere. Um, tonight I'm sitting in one of our small libraries. If you know the Jerwood Centre, you'll know there's a rotunda with it. And, and I'm sitting in the room uh, at the top of that. Um, and it's in this room that we keep our Lake District guide. So the books behind me deal a lot with Lake District topography from about 1750 onwards. And, and tonight we'll be looking at some of the, some of the books, as I say, uh, but we'll also be looking at a very special manuscript, um, special to our guest, uh, but also special to our collection here. And as always, it's a great pleasure to co-host this with Professor Simon Bainbridge of Lancaster. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yes, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, as Jeff says, my name is Simon Bainbridge from Lancaster University. I'm also a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust, and I've been the lead educator on the Future Learn course on William Wordsworth Poetry, People and Place. And I know we've got a number of people who've been on that course. So um, great to see you all again. So it'd be very interesting, I think, um, today to find out among, uh, uh, amongst other things, you know, what William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth did during the Regency. I mean, these, this isn't a period we necessarily associate with them. So looking mm. forward to talking to Robert uh, about that. Mm. So as ever, we've had a couple of questions in advance, but we would solicit now any questions you might have or that might come up uh, uh, to you during the course of, of uh, of, of our discussion, please put them in our in the chat box, and um, we'll do our best to get to them. So, if you, you know, if you want to ask Robert, you know, what his favourite book of the um, the Regency years is, or you know, which celebrity he most enjoyed researching, or um, or the most surprising thing he discovered about this great period of history was, then please, um, yeah, please do do put those in. Um, and we've already got a good question, which which is pretty much going to be a, a starting point in just a moment. How do we define the Regency? So we will be, we will be, coming, to, we will be coming to that. So thank you very much for that, Yasmin. Um, the format for the evening, you know, as Hannah has already outlined, is um, that Simon, uh, Simon, that I and uh, uh, Jeff <laughs> will, will be in conversation with Rob for the first half, about 40 minutes or so. Uh, if it feels like we need to, we'll take a quick five minute break at that point. After the break, as Jeff says, we're going to look at a very special item from the, the, the collection and continue the conversation. We'll try and feed your questions in um, throughout. Um, and obviously, the earlier you can get them to us, then the easier it is for, for us to do that. Just to mention as well that um, we're recording this event, uh, but the only it's only us panellists who will be visible uh, and audible. It's only our faces that will appear uh, on the recording. 
So I'm going to pass back to Jeff now to introduce tonight's great speaker. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased by Yasmin's question because that was that was one of my great <laughs> things. I think I, I had a different uh, sense of what we call whenever we talk about the Regency. It, it Yeah, it, it meant something different to me to, as it's more perhaps clearly defined. So, uh, Professor Robert Morrison uh, specializes in 19th century British literature and culture. He is the British Academy Global Professor at Bath Spa University and Queen's National Scholar at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. In 2017, he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Um, he's one of the editors of the 21 volume collected works of Thomas de Quincey. This was a great work that came out in 2000. Um, it's 21 volumes, as I say, and it, and it really graces our, our reading room. He's the author of um, this wonderful book too, um, The English Opium Eater, a biography of Thomas de Quincey, which was 2009. Uh, that was shortlisted for the James Tate Black Prize in, in, in 2010. And of other published things, again, which sort of some of them focusing on on this period, um, uh, an annotated edition of Jane Austen's Persuasion um, with uh, Daniel Roberts, he edited Romanticism and Blackwood's magazine, and with Chris Baldick, he co-edited The Vampire and Other Tales of the Macabre. His most recent book is Regency Revolution, Jane Austen, Napoleon, Lord Byron, and the Making of the Modern World, and is published in America under a different title. Now, I have the if, if you have the book, it, it probably isn't this one. This is the one that was published over the sea, as it were. And this is the Regency years uh, during which uh, Jane Austen writes, Napoleon fights, Byron makes love, and Britain becomes modern. So they, <laughs> that's it. That's our evening yeah. in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> it, it was named by The Economist as one of the 2019 books of the year and long listed for the RBC Taylor Prize for Excellence in Literary Nonfiction. It's been shortlisted for the Historical Writers Association Prize for the best in nonfiction historical writing. So I, is that all news, Rob? Has, has any results come of that or are you uh, still yeah, Yes. No, I'm not waiting. I lost yesterday. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I, a great, a, a superb book, a uh, 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 well, Fistful of Shells won. It's a superb book. And uh, yeah, I'm just thrilled to have made it as far as I did. Well, congratulations really? on getting that far. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. I'm sure it was a damn close run thing to use one of the most famous Regency lines. <laughs> that is one of the most famous Regency lines. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that aside, um, Rob has been um, a great friend to the to the Wordsworth Trust, Wordsworth Grasmere, for many years. In the 1990s, living living not far from here. Um, you were telling us that your, your first son was born in Lancaster Hospital. You thought of applying for a job at Lancaster, but may have reached a conclusion as to whether that was right or not, even, even this week. Uh, well, I certainly, we had just moved back to Canada and it was one year later and we thought, can we move again? Yeah. And we decided we couldn't. But when we play, what would our lives have been? Um, you know, every, twice a year, we think, what if we'd apply for that job in Lancaster and not got it? But when Simon told me that he'd applied and didn't get it, I then knew that there was, if Simon didn't get it, I was never going to get it. So that's eased my mind after 30 years of, you know, gnashing my teeth. <laughs> um, we've also swapped stories, haven't we, about our experiences with, uh, with the punk poet John Cooper Clark. Yes. Um, which, which, are, which are good stories. My memory of that occasion was in being in our library looking at a De Quincey manuscript and telling me how he just couldn't stand Wordsworth. So, so you know, well, De Quincey did it for him and Wordsworth was just boring. So, you know, I, I guess can I, we can't Jeff, be perfect. Can I tell you a very quick anecdote about meeting John Cooper Clark? I met John Cooper Clark in London and I was very, very nervous because I thought, I'm this sort of square scholar, and this is a great punk poet. And he came into the room, and I looked across, and I thought it was Ronnie Wood. I thought I can meet Ronnie Wood and and John Cooper Clark the same day. And when he came over, I knew it was him, and he introduced himself, and he said, "You're Canadian," and I said, "Yes, I am Canadian." And then he said, "Paul Anka is Canadian," and I said, "Yes, Paul Anka is Canadian." I drove over Paul Anka Drive to to get here. And he said, what's Paul Anka's greatest song? And I said, Lonely Boy. And, you know, put your head in my shoulders. I went through my head, but I said, Lonely Boy. And he looked at me and he went, is the right answer. 
And then all my nervousness disappeared and all my, I thought, oh, I'm going to get along with John Cooper Clark as we share an admiration for the early Paul Anka. And after that, we talked about Thomas De Quincey and he made the same point. He doesn't like Wordsworth. <laughs> and, uh, and we had a great, a great time. But that initial exchange, I never thought Paul Anka trivia was going to help me out. But it turns out that John Cooper Clark is a fan of Paul Anka and Thomas De Quincey. Well, well my, my very quick anecdote is having supper with John Cooper Clark and, and, the, and one of his uh, staff, as it were, and the conversation was about the bins being emptied in Manchester and about the architecture and French cathedrals. And I didn't feel like <laughs> joining either of those. So <laughs> that, that's, that's John Cooper Clark. I did just want to share a very quick photograph with you, with you, with you, with you, Rob, um, <laughs> which will bring back a memory, I think. Um, if that brings back a memory. I can't see it. Oh, yes, oh. I can see that. So that's that's the launch of your De Quincey book in 2009, I think, with the editor of the Westmoreland Gazette. I that's think exactly it who it is. And you put that decanter there to suggest De Quincey's uh, <laughs> fascination with Laudanum, which I loved. And uh, uh, that was a very, uh, very, very exciting day. My dear friend John was there and my dear friend Ben and my two sons and my, and my wife, Carol. It was wonderful. wonderful. And another good oh. friend. That's I've not been the man in the middle, I mean the man on the right. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that is my very, very dear friend, Greville Lindop. And uh, Greville wrote a biography of De Quincey, of course, as everyone knows, in 1981. And uh, I had a, a beer with Greville in, a, in an Oxford pub uh, in 2006. And I said, I think I'm going to try to write a biography. What should I do and what should I look out for? And Greville, with absolute characteristic generosity, took me through everything that he did and places that he thought I might look. And um, yeah, Greville has been uh, a very dear friend for 30 years. And he's a wonderful poet and scholar. And he's writing a book on Yeats now. And like Simon, a, a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust. Um, yes. In his case. Yes. Wonderful. That's a wonderful picture, Jack. When you get a chance, can you mail? I will do. <laughs> email. I Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I very much enjoyed uh, reading the book, Rob. Let me offer my congratulations on it, and uh, you know I'd thoroughly recommend it to the to the, the viewers tonight. It's absolutely packed. I mean, it is amazing how much material you have you have got in there, and the the range of research, the scope of the book is is wonderful. I mean, you've got a cast of thousands in there. Um, yes. There's lots of big stars. We might talk about some of the sort of the big stars uh, uh, as the evening goes on. I mean, it's very lively. It's funny and, and uh, certainly highly entertaining. It's also quite serious. I mean, there was that you know you talk about the the dark side of the period um, as well. You know, in ways that are, are quite disturbing. You know, I think we discover some things in the book that are that are quite shocking actually, which again we might um, come to a bit later. But I wonder if I can I can begin by picking up on Yasmin's question that she'd already posted, and just ask you to de to define for us, you know, what was the Regency, and tell us a bit about what makes it this kind of fascinating period that made it worth devoting the, the book, and I'm sure many years of research too. Yes, uh, well, the Regency is um is a term that's sometimes used to cover rather uh, rather a lot Regency furniture or Regency design or Regency architecture. But there is a sort of, it, it has a constitutional reality as well. And that came about in 1811 when King George III, who had had mental health issues uh, uh, from 1788 onward, these severe ones onward, um, he finally collapsed. His youngest daughter, Amelia, died. He was grief stricken. He went into sort of decline and he did not recover. And so in 1810, Parliament starts to think that if the monarch is incapacitated, that means his heir takes the throne as the regent. And so in 1810, it came before Parliament and on February 5th, 1811, uh, the Prince of Wales, George, Prince of Wales, became the Prince Regent. My students always get sort of cross because they think George Gordon and Lord Byron are the same person or Arthur Wellesley is the Duke of Wellington. That doesn't make any sense. Well, You've got, he's the priest George, then he's a week later, he's the Prince of Wales, then he's the Prince Regent, and then he's King George IV. So on February 5th, he becomes the Prince Regent, and he has, he is essentially Britain's king. And he stays Prince Regent until, of course, uh, his father dies on January 29th, uh, 1820. So 200 years ago this year, his father dies on January 29th. And of course, as soon as his father dies, then he is King George 
the fourth, and he's on the throne from 1820 to 1830. Uh, uh, then his brother William, and then of course Victoria takes us to the end of the of the 19th century. So it has this constitutional reality. Um, but uh, if it, if it had been from 1807 to 18, you know, 16, it wouldn't have quite the elegance it has because it starts in you know it's, the, it's being mooted in 1810, starts in 1811, and it ends wonderfully <laughs> in 1820. And so it's got this constitutional reality, and it's got this beautiful symmetry about it as well. He is that is George the Prince Regent is on the throne, ruling Britain for those 10 years. And so when I started to think, well, there, there's a trend in Romanticism, of course, to go you know, backward and forward, to, to, to fold Romanticism into the long 19th century. And I sort of feel a bit queasy about that. I, I, I worry Romanticism is going to disappear. And so I thought, what would happen if I didn't go outward? I went inward. And the middle decade of Romanticism is the Regency. So it presented itself to me in a number of ways as a really fascinating period. Uh, and the other thing I'll, I'll say just quickly is that George III, as many of uh, our audience will know, was a very pious man, a very industrious man, a man devoted to his wife, a very thrifty man, etc. And the best way to think of his son is the exact opposite. His son is a womanizer, his son drinks, his son is clearly addicted to opium, his son <laughs> runs up debts that are staggering, etc., etc., etc. And so uh, the contrast between George III, the Prince Regent, and George IV is remarkable. So it drew me to it. And then Waterloo's in it, and Jane Austen publishes all six of her novels in the Regency. And pretty soon, you know, you just can't stop thinking about this decade, which is where I ended up. Thank you. A fascinating definition. And as you say, an incredible period of sort of remarkable compression of historical and cultural events within such a, a short period. So as you said, it's, the, it's the, the age of Jane Austen, it's the age of Lord Byron, um, it's the age of John Constable, it's the, the age of, uh, of Turner, astonishing um, literary and artistic richness during the period. I wonder if you could, can you just say a bit more about the regent, who is the, the figure after whom the, the period is named? Because um, as you've suggested, you know, he's often remembered almost as a kind of almost comic um, mm. uh, sort of wastrel, and that's how he still appears if people watch Blackadder and programs like that. Mm. You, mm. You, you point to a sort of another side um, to the region, that he could be quite a sort of discerning reader, for example. Yes. Well, I, I ended up uh, fascinated by the Prince Regent um, because, uh, you know, the monarchy now can take, you know, can take quite a bit of stick from the media and from, you know, spitting image or whatever, whatever satirical program it is. But I don't think there's ever been a monarch who was flailed like the regent was. And in very many instances, deservedly so. He was grossly overweight. He was very often complete. I start the book by saying he was essentially out of touch politically with what was going on. He knew he wanted Wellington to win Waterloo. And he had, you know, fantasies about later in his life about actually being there with Wellington helping him out, <laughs> which is categorically not the case. And so uh, he has this reputation as obese, as uh, whiskered, as uh, 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 not in touch at all. And there is truth in all of that. And when something uh, tragic happened, like Peter Lou, his opinion was they shouldn't have gathered in those numbers anyway. So uh, uh, from a political side of thing, it's very hard. And as a, per you know, he... He's a serial adulterer. He's not loyal to his friends, Bo Brummel being the most obvious example. Uh, um, you know, there are plenty of aspects of his personality that are pretty unpalatable. However, what really fascinated me was the way in which his sense of uh, art and letters and science and engineering um, really guided Regency Britain. Yes, he supported gambling. Yes, he supported horse racing. Yes, he loved prize fighting and, and, and frequented, you know, plenty of drinking dens. But he knew uh, uh, before many of his contemporaries that Jane Austen was an important figure. And he has her works in, his in all his libraries. And of course, when you open up Emma, the first thing you see is that Emma is devoted to the Prince Regent. Now, now we think of Jane Austen, we think, well, everybody knows. Well, when, when uh, Emma came out, not everybody knew. But the Prince Regent did. And when he saw Constable, he supported Constable. And when he saw David Wilkie, he supported David Wilkie. 
who's a huge admirer of Walter Scott. Byron was very impressed with his ability to talk about contemporary uh, poetry, you, you know, for example. And so I, I end up, I ended up going, all right, what's going, what's going on here? How can this person? And so at the end of the book, I say, there's not been a member of the royal family before or since that has galvanized uh, the arts and the sciences. Uh, Isaac Newton was knighted. Uh, the next person to be knighted is Humphrey Davy in 1812. And he's knighted by the regent because the regent thinks science is very important. Scientists are very important. He's a great lover of the theater. He's a great admirer of Edmund Keane, for example. And so you've got all the energy and power and clout and visibility of the monarchy, you know, praising painting, praising novelists, praising poets, uh, uh, praising scientists. And, uh, you know, I'm somebody who believes that uh, our, our culture today could do with a little bit more attention to poets and actors and artists and scientists and engineers who really elevate what we're able to achieve. And of course, scientists now in this recent crisis, you know, as the COVID broke out and everybody went, all right, <laughs> how are we going to solve this? And so uh, the region celebration of those things seemed to me to be an, a, a neglected side of his character that really did galvanize this extraordinary outputting. Of course, there were other factors involved. I'm not for a minute claiming that you know he's he's entirely responsible, but uh, uh, his his father wasn't that interested, and his brother wasn't that interested. He was, and the quote and energy of the monarchy is able to to you know then as now is able to bring attention to people and events that uh, uh, change public opinion. Thanks, Rob. So we, we've got a question related to this that's coming from Janet O'Donnell, and she, she's asking, how was the Prince Regent viewed by his subjects? Oh, well, uh, most of them, thank you for the question, most of them uh, loathed him because he was out of touch with their suffering. Most of them, mo most of them found him absolutely insufferable. They don't have enough to eat, and he's you, you know, belting back gargantuan quantities of food and drink. And so um, he is, uh, uh, when, when, uh, when Spencer Percival, for example, is assassinated, the only time a British prime minister has been assassinated was in the Regency. And the masses in London are euphoric. Uh, they think this person has gone out and assassinated the prime minister as a way of hitting back at the privilege and power located in uh, Westminster. But People further up the social hierarchies, you know, are pretty are pretty keen on him. He's very interested in art. He's very interested. Just if you're hungry and someone tells you they're interested in art, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily go down very well. So broadly speaking, he's look people like Cruchet, the great character uh, caricature is Cruchet. And my goodness, when I started working in the Regency, you know, we think of Cruchet, or at least I did, as associated with Dickens. But Cruchet is everywhere. In the Regency. When I collected the images for the book, it was Cruchank, Cruchank, Rollinson, Rollinson, Cruchank, Cruchank, Cruchank. Mm -hmm. It was remarkable, his satiric uh, energy. So, you know, the, 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 uh, the vast majority of the population, I think it's safe to say, didn't think very much of him. And even someone like Southey, who's pro monarchy, has got a hard time with the Regent. But there are artists and uh, scientists benefit from him enormously. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you mentioned the um, the death of Percival there, and I think that relates to some of the um, objects in the trust collection, doesn't it, Jeff? It does. I, I, I was really taken by that in your book. It, it relates to a couple of things. One is um, in 1812, May 1812, William and, and Dorothy, William and Mary, um, his wife, of course, are separated uh, at different parts of the country. He's in London, Mary's in Herefordshire. And uh, in one of the, what we call the love letters, one of these letters discovered in 1977, um, mm. they have this exchange, don't they? Um, and mm. William's kind of trying to keep Mary up to date. Remarkably, Mary gets the news of the assassination within about 48 hours. Um, and she, like, um, I guess, in, in these circumstances, she, she, she's kind of relieved that um, the person is thought to be a lunatic, because why else would anybody want to do such a thing? But from what you're saying, um, she was perhaps on a different side of the spectrum to people who we're almost pleased by the news or by the, by the event. Well, Wordsworth is in London at the time. I mean, it's kind of like one of the things I wanted to achieve with the book is to take a name like Wordsworth and try to put him in different lights. And mm. so, 
there, there's not a great deal done on the fact that Wordsworth was in London uh, uh, at the moment when, uh, for the only time in British history, the prime minister, thank goodness, was assassinated. And Wordsworth is um, outraged. Wordsworth is not with the people who are euphoric. Wordsworth is angry. And one, there's a wonderful moment that I made sure was in the book where someone says, well, you know, Mr. Wordsworth, what are people supposed to do if they're hungry, if they're starving, if they have no food? And Wordsworth says, well, not shoot anybody, not murder anybody, or if they do murder them, it should be to eat their hearts. And I meant, okay, that's that's not a side of Wordsworth that people necessarily think about. And I, I take Wordsworth to mean if they're hungry, then I don't mind them going out and looking for food, even if that happens to be the heart of the prime minister. What I object to are these people uh, employing violence to change the political uh, uh, structures. And so Wordsworth was... Um, uh, uh, on the side of the monarchy. I think there's a difference between being on the side of the monarchy and being on the side of the regent. Uh, uh, you know, people people had to sort of excuse the regent, but they believed uh, in the institution of the monarchy. So Wordsworth is a good example of somebody who didn't delight in what had happened. But he is horrified as he walks around London and he says to Mary, uh, uh, the, 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 the happiness of the people that the prime minister has been assassinated floored him. And in a way, his surprise, I think, is very, very revealing. I think, you know, he, he, he thinks that, well, by and large, things must be all right. And when uh, uh, um, Bellingham assassinates Spencer Percival, walks into the House of Commons and assassinates him, uh, it, it is a moment of great rejoicing for people who feel like the government and the regent and the politicians are not listening. And when you know that people could starve in the streets in Regency Britain, it's not the regency that you find in Emma. It's not the regency that you find in Pride and Prejudice. Not that that isn't an accurate reflection of one side of it, but like our society, like any society, it's multifaceted. And there were people who led very, very unpleasant lives. And Jane Austen isn't uh, 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 really interested in them, but those are the people that were very happy to see a politician assassinated. And openly, Coleridge is one at the same time, he's horrified too. One of the things I really enjoyed about your book was the fact that you tell all these hidden histories. That there are so many people who never get a mention either individually or, or or as a group of people in in if you like the standard histories whereas yours you really you really do bring them to to, to our attention and and whether they're, they're uh, people suffering from the highland clearances they're people in a criminal world in london or they're people indigenous populations in australia uh, or, or north america so and again maybe maybe we can come back to that later on but I, one thing that also struck me, Rob, about the 1812 moment was just how quickly things happened. Because in Wordsworth's letter, he, he says that he, he would have gone to see the execution. Yes. Um, but he didn't want to put himself at risk. And, and in our collection, yeah. if, I, if, I, I, yeah. if I may just for a moment um, sh show something from the collection, um, if I can share my screen, um, because this this rather... This is from a, a collection we got in 2005 um, from Sir Geoffrey Bowman, the human rights lawyer. And if you can yes. see that, it's the account of the of the yes. trial. Yes. And uh, it says here that the murder was on the 11th of May. The trial was on the 15th of May. <laughs> so what's that four days later? Yes. And then Wordsworth tells us that the that, that Bellingham was executed on the 18th. So One almost week. like from One Monday week. to Monday. You, 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 you know, there's no, there's no time for forensic, forensic investigations at this point. Um, that, that's it, isn't it? Yes, it's astonishing how quickly it happened. Byron um, is, of course, in London in May 1812, and he rents a window across from the Newgate Yard because he wants a really good look at Bellingham leaving the planet. And so he, you know, he's quite open about the fact this is, uh, you know, something that verges on an entertainment. And you really don't want to miss the execution of the man who shot the prime minister. And the other person who's there of note um, is William Cobbett, who's in prison uh, uh, for his radicalism and his political activities. And Wordsworth decides that it's not, as you say, it's not, it's not worth it. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the speed with which the trial happens mm -hmm. and the way in which justice is um, executed in the 
part of the book, as as you'll recall, Jeff, talks about what was called the bl the bloody code, mm -hmm. the the legal code that governed Regency Britain, mm -hmm. and um, that takes us. That's a, it's a it's a horrifyingly severe um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. body of law that really terrorizes people who don't have that protects the interests of people who have land and money, and that really um, uh, meets out bloody justice to those who don't. Um, I mean, so I think, yeah. the fact that he's he, the fact that he's apprehended, sentenced, and killed in a week yeah. is is typical. I mean, something that again struck me in your book was, was this awful bloody code towards homosexuals. I mean that that I mean that that's a that's a I know that's a whole different topic, but that that's it's shocking. Some of the some of the the narratives you describe um, are just well. The, the the if you were if you were a homosexual male if you were if you were a, a lesbian in the regency um as i detail you nothing happened to you because the judges and the lawyers didn't believe it existed mm -hmm. so so for this one way uh, a lesbian woman so the most famous lesbian uh, 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 person in the regency is Anne lister who people know from the recent uh, miniseries and Lister talks in great detail and with great enthusiasm about her uh, experiences of same-sex love. And it is, it is revelatory to read her journals. But if you were a, a man who was interested in same-sex love, like, for instance, Lord Byron, you had to be extremely careful because if you were caught, you were hanged. You were pilloried uh, to, to, to within a few inches of your death, and then you were hanged. And William Beckford, uh, uh, you, you know, the the very wealthy uh, uh, sugar plantation owner who wrote Vathe. Beckford says, I, and who is also homosexual, says, I would like to know what deity they think they are placating by these shocking murders. And I, I have to say, I found it a, a really uh, moving and deeply upsetting aspect of the Regency that I, I, I knew very, very little about. And, um, uh, you know, at the same time, people like Beckford and uh, uh, people like Jeremy Bentham write about Bentham writes about uh, what we would now call homosexuality, uh, uh, and he writes about it in a way that is uh, uh, pr uh, astonishingly prescient. And it's in manuscripts in University College London because Bentham said, "If I publish this, it would bring so much opprobrium on me that every other research or every other uh, 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 reform agenda, every other uh, 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 reform I'd like to to make would get." would get sent out to sea because people would be so horrified by my advocacy. But he sounds remarkably modern when he describes um, same-sex love and the practice of same-sex love. And he essentially says, it's an imaginary crime. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that drew me to the Regency, which of course it is, one of the things that drew me to the Regency and the reason the modern world is in the title is because I really do feel like um, it marks a moment when, for example, people start saying, you know, who cares? <laughs> you know, the question is, is he pleasant or unpleasant? Is he kind, is, she, is she kind or unkind? Not what the sexual preference. And so I, I, I felt um, I, I was pleased to write a book that got to say those kinds of mm. things, make those mm. kinds of points, and to celebrate the the courage and the insight of a Bentham or a, or, or a Beck or a Percy Shelley or a Lord Byron. And very, very powerfully written, powerfully written it is. I see in the chat that we have people uh, nominating books. Well, this is the moment where we can show a slide of the of the ones that you you highlight. So amongst the many you highlight, uh, Rob. So I'll put the I'll put the picture on the screen. Um, and um, so yeah, while you're, while you're doing that, Jeff, we have already. Um, there's some overlap, I think, with the things that we chose uh, and the things that people have nominated. So um, we should say, first of all, a number of people have gone for Jane Austen, and we would have agreed with that. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the Trust doesn't actually have a first edition of Jane Austen. Um, can so can I say, anyone, Simon, that we would, we would, of course, welcome one. I was just going to say, uh, if anyone has there a spare who, copy. who happens to have a spare first edition. Uh, we've also <laughs> had some other very interesting ones that don't feature um, in, the, in the ones we've chosen. So... James Hogg's Confessions of a Justified Sinner, which is a fascinating um, book. Mm. Anna Letitia Barbell's 1811, they've received nominations. But the ones we went for, which sort of span the period pretty much, are uh, Byron's Child Harold uh, on the end there, 
published in 1812. Then we've got Walter Scott's Waverley, um, for the first historical novel. So we're going to ask Robert to talk about some of these in more detail in a moment. So that's 1814. 1814, also the year of Wordsworth's Excursion, of course. This is the big book that Wordsworth publishes during the Regency period that he thinks is going to um, really be the significant publication of his, of his yeah. life. And I think we would have, if we had it, we would have added um, Pride and Prejudice uh, to that incredible collection of uh, works that are coming out in 1814. Then um, we've got Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, which interestingly no one uh, mentioned. So that's um, from 1818 that that's published. I think we've then got Percy Shelley's Prometheus Unbound and other poems. Um, and then I think that's 1820. And right at the end there, I think that's John Clare's first volume of poetry. Mm -hmm. So uh, also 1820. So an absolutely uh, yeah, fantastic illustration from Jeff there of the richness of the literature yeah. um, of this decade. I mean, you do wonder if there is any decade um, that compares with it for the number of writers producing such um, extraordinary works. So Jeff, I think you've actually got, are you able to show us um, these, yeah. these uh, versions of some of these books? Can we start yeah. with, should we have a look at Child Harold? Absolutely. Able to um, put that on screen. And I could just ask Robert, maybe you could, I mean, Child Harold feels to me like in a way, the book that sort of kickstarts the Regency mm. literature mm. of the period, you know, published in 1812, as Byron famously says, when it's published, he, he, he woke up to find himself famous. And, you know, Byron uh, is, a, is one of the big stars, I think, of your book. Um, you know, if we, if we were, had the Hollywood blockbuster advert, yeah. you know, Lord Byron's name would be up about that. So can you just tell us a bit about Child Harold, why it's so important and why Byron becomes such a big star in the period? Sure. Can I just back up just very quickly to say that um, the, there, there is so much that, that that sort of showcase of books is astonishing. And you could add to that, you know, any one of Austin's six novels came out in the Regency. And so I, I had to make a decision very early on that if it wasn't published in the, it wasn't exactly in the Regency, I had to get rid of it. And so a, a book like Confessions of a Justified Sinner, which I think is so uh, such a wonderful book, I teach that book often, it's 1824. And I, uh, I, I, I cannot tell you the number of times that I, you know, held my breath and went, oh, I hope that he was working on the manuscript <laughs> or something. So because my world sort of, if it was 1821, my world ended and I didn't, it didn't count. And uh, so, yeah, uh, it, it is remarkable what happened um, in the Regency um, and the number of books that came out. And it's heartbreaking how many great books are quite close on either, uh, on either end. Uh, Yes, uh, Byron publishes Old Herald's Pilgrimage, which is in a sense, which is in a sense, uh, kind of a poetic travel log of the time he has just spent uh, in uh, uh, Europe, well south of where Napoleon is fighting in places like as Jeff's got there, Spain and Portugal and Albania, and he comes back and he publishes it in uh, uh, March 1812, and he says, as Simon said very famously, "I woke one more to find myself." Famous. And this begins this remarkable run. It's not that Byron hasn't published poems uh, previous to this. He's published Hours of Idleness. He's published English Bard and Scots Reviewer, Scots Reviewers. But this is the one that changes everything uh, to some extent because it introduces the, the character of the Byronic hero, which, of course, Byron comes back to over and over and over again, culminating, I would say, with uh, uh, Manfred in 1817. Uh, um, but the uh, the intensity and the uh, uh, the innovations of this poem, his skill with verse, and the fact that he is a, a lord and strikingly handsome and quite a flamboyant uh, a personality also helps. And I, I say in the book, and I'm not the first caller to say this, loads of people have said it, that Byron, uh, uh, from many perspectives, is the first modern celebrity, and Child Herald is the poem that makes him... Uh, uh, famous. And of course, he writes a third canto when he's in Switzerland, uh, uh, and uh, then the final canto comes out in 1818. Um, 18. It is, reading it over again, uh, in the context of the Regency, and this is one of the things that we spoke about uh, uh, on Monday, reading it in the context of the Regency is different, at least I find it different, than reading it in the context of Byron's career. It stands out 
uh, as this sort of not launching the regency necessarily, but I know what you mean, Simon. It sort of catapults Byron and makes him the most famous man in the regency. And there follows what are called, of course, the years of fame until he gets run out in April 1816 and never returns um, to Britain. It was remarkable to me how many of the leading characters, like Byron, like Prince, uh, uh, like, uh, like Wellington, like Beau Brummel, people that we think of as Regency figures, uh, are, spend a good deal of time outside of Britain. Uh, Charles Harold the Pogrom about traveling. And uh, 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 I, I think it, 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 it in many ways uh, emblematizes the age. And its sales are just astonishing. Fantastic, thanks Robert. I was just gonna say it's so nice as well to see it, to see the first edition uh, while yep. you're talking about it, because one of the things you get is, is a sense of um, what, what an impressive volume um, it is. You know, it's, a, it, it's large and the, re you know, the reading experience, um, just looking at the type is so different from the reading experience we often have now when we, you know, we pick up a volume of fire and it's fairly compressed. There's a lot of verse, lots of stanzas on each um, each page. I mean, here what we have just two two stanzas generally per page. So it's a very it's almost a luxurious object, isn't it? And a luxurious reading experience. Yes, when I when you show the picture with the excursion, you get a sense of how uh, important Wordsworth thought that poem was to put it out in that format. You know, Charles Lamb called the excursion a great armful of poetry. And when you see that volume, you can see that Wordsworth was hoping to make pretty substantial, dare I say, kind of Miltonic claims for what that poem had, uh, uh, what he felt that poem, or at least I think hoped that poem had achieved. It's magnificent to see just the bulk of it. So here, here Jeff, has, Jeff has taken us to the excursion here, being a, a portion of the recluse, uh, a poem. Uh, and of course, you know, this is not a book that is um, much read now, really, certainly not by the, by the general public. Um, can you say a little bit about its place in the Regency period, Robert, for us, please? Well, I, uh, you know, when I decided this is what I was going to do, I started and I reread Austin's six novels and thought, okay, what does this tell us about the Regency? And then I made my way across other things until I got to the excursion. And the first time I read the excursion was when I was much, much younger. And uh, Jonathan Wordsworth was my tutor and he said, go away and read the excursion. So I went away and read the excursion with uh, Francis Jeffries, this will never do, pounding in my head. And I sat down thinking this will never do. And I got halfway through and I thought, well, this will never do. <laughs> and I, you know, I pushed my way to the end and I said, yes, Jonathan, I read it. And, and I, I thought next to the, the prelude that it, it hadn't, uh, it hadn't engaged me anywhere near as much as the prelude, although I don't think I was a very good reader of poetry, at least back then. I hope I'm a little better now. Um, uh, uh, but when I read it for this project, I got very excited about it. So for example, Jeff, can you just stay there for a second? That uh, um, uh, is uh, that book, the first book is called The Wanderer. Now that book comes out in 1814. One of the novels that I didn't get a chance to talk about to anywhere near the length I wanted is by Francis Burney, whom of course we associate with the end of the uh, 18th century, but Frances Burney published her last novel in 1814, and that novel is called The Wanderer, or Female Difficulties. And uh, Burney does this magnificent job of outlining what it is that thwarts the lives of women living in the Regency. And it is striking to me, and I would say characteristic of the Regency, that Wordsworth begins his poem with a book called The Wanderer, and in that same year, uh, uh, Frances Burney comes out with her last novel, which is called The Wanderer. In other words, there is a kind of a dialogic feel going on. And of course, people, Byron is wandering in Child's Herald, uh, uh, The Wanderer, Frances Burney's The Wanderer. Uh, uh, you know, Britain has been at war for a long time now on, well, almost continuously since 1793. And so there is a sense of displacement. There is a sense of upheaval. There is a sense of, you know, uh, 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 of the culture coming a bit unmoored. And so when I read um, the, the excursion again, it seemed to me to do much better uh, in my head as a kind of a work, a product of the Regency. And so, for example, one of the things I say in the book is Wordsworth is talking about industrialism. And he says industrialism was, quote, a new and unforeseen creation. 
And I read that line and I thought, now Mary Shelley's going to begin Frankenstein in about 20 months. And there's words we're talking about industrialism as a new and unforeseen creation. And I thought, well, I, I well, of course, I read over that uh, when I first read it. But it was an example to me of a moment when Wordsworth seemed more engaged with and the, and the excursion seemed more engaged with the age um, than I had previously given it credit for. And I think, you know, when you put in 1814, Mansfield Park comes out, the uh, excursion comes out, Waverly comes out, and Francis Burney comes out. And if you read those works back to back to back to back, it's astonishing, at least in my life, it was astonishing to watch how concentrating on the year rather than the career of the poet changed uh, my perception of the work. And I ended up thinking, I ended up uh, uh, for, much further away from Francis Jeffrey, and I wasn't, I didn't become as enthusiastic as Keats when he says excursion is one of the three things to rejoice at uh, of the age. But the fact that Keats said of the age really grabbed my attention. Uh, uh, I ended up thinking, Keats says that in 1818, and uh, and uh, I ended up thinking that 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 you know Keats was that well unsurprisingly Keats was onto something uh, as a reader of poetry and as a, as an admirer of Wordsworth. Well, one of the things, sorry, David, if I may just say about this particular book, one of the things you talk about, Rob, is is the new sort of reading clubs, reading societies, and how reading was was more widely shared. This particular copy, I, I don't know whether the camera can show it. But this this belongs to Harrow Literary Club. Can you? Is that wow, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so yes. this must be this could be one of those sort of societies you talk about. Um, and it says here, please uh, cross off your name uh, when you've read the volume, so you can see that what wow. does it have? Maybe thirty percent <laughs> um, of the possible members have read it, something like that. But uh, an interesting number of clergymen uh, amongst the list. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was just wondering, Jeff, if we might um, we might move to have a look at Scott's Waverley, given yeah. Robert just mentioned that as one of the other um, you know, really important um, mm. publications of, of this this incredible year, 1814. Um, and it's, it's my understanding, Rob, that um, I mean, Scott, up until the emergence of Byron, um, is the best-selling poet of the period, isn't he? Yes, um, yes, he is. And then Byron yes, appears, is. And, and, and Scott, I mean, he still writes a bit of poetry, but basically he decides to write something else. And the first the first type of that something else is is, is the book that uh, Jeff is showing us now, Waverley or, or 60 Years Since, which it's another it's another book of um, war and wandering in a way, isn't it? Um, to yes. That, that great description you've just given of the excursion. Yes. Um, well, as Scott says, um, he reads Child Herald, uh, the book we've just seen a few moments ago, and Scott says, Byron beat me. In other words, Scott knows, Scott is set, you know, Scott's a great novelist, and I would say a great writer of uh, tales, uh, particularly Gothic tales, but he's also a superb literary critic. And when you read Scott in the quarterly in 1816 on Austin's Emma, you can see, and when you read his comments and his letters about Austin Zemmer, you can see what a fine uh, literary critic he was um, as well. And as soon as he read Child Harold, he said, well, that's it for me as a poet. I, 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 be I better try something else. And so he turns to something that he'd begun a few years earlier, and he writes Waverly. And of course, we all know the blazing speed with which Scott could churn out these novels. It is astonishing how quickly uh, uh, he takes a, a novel that's sort of not really formed and produces Waverly. And the kind of galvanic shock it makes on the reading audience in the Regency. And the, the thing that really uh, um, captured me thinking about and reading Waverly was this is an age that, as I've already said, in so, in so many ways uh, uh, anticipates uh, some of the anxieties and some of the uh, uh, confusion that we are experiencing today in a whole bunch of ways. But the most popular novel of the period, Look Backwards, was historical. He founded the historical novel. And so you always get this sense of this Janus faced looking back 60 years since and looking forward uh, in ways, in, in, especially in terms of uh, uh, science, but also, you know, J.M.W. Turner is painting during, <laughs> during the Regency, painting uh, um, you know, astonishing work during the Regency. So it's a period that really I see as a, as a pivot 
you know, it, it's not to say that it breaks um, completely with what came before. It feeds off of and is inspired by history in remarkable ways, and none I think more remarkable than Waverly. Uh, and then, of course, he goes on to just write more Waverly, you know, you know Heart of Midlothian and, and Ivanhoe and, uh, you know, the Antiquarian, a whole, uh, you know, a whole series of other ones. It's, it's interesting isn't it? this is this is the the second edition, but it's in the same year as the first edition, and I guess that's maybe a suggestion of how popular it was. Um, we, we've yeah. got something like a seventh edition by 1817, so it, it must have been it must really have been selling. It, it is astonishing how uh, Scott can sell 10,000 copies in a morning. 10,000 copies <laughs> in a morning. That's you know that's uh, I would say as everybody would change in their pocket, you, you know, in the Regency buys a copy of Scott's novels, and I. There were lots of testimonies to to the grip these novels had on, uh, you know, Peacock says everybody reads these. Uh, uh, servants, men and women uh, read it. Clergymen read it. Scientists read it. Politicians read it. Everybody reads Scott. And um, uh, uh, his ability to uh, uh, produce uh, uh, more historical novels, you know, one after another is, is, uh, is really remarkable and waverly goes through four editions in the first year jeff wow. so that <laughs> that does, and it's published i don't want to get it wrong i think it's 7 july 1814 so he didn't even have the decency to bring it out in january <laughs> he brings it out when the year is half over and it still sells henry coburn you know the the edinburgh lawyer in his um diary talked about the electrical shock of waverly nothing history had not history was sort of window dressing prior to Scott. That's often what is said. And Scott just brought history alive and brought Scottish history alive. And, uh, uh, you know, the veracity with which he renders these events and these people um, in, in Waverley, of course, Barney Prince Charlie, is uh, it, it was brand new and laid the foundation for uh, the historical novel. It's interesting that you have Valentine there. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying that, that words with in order to help his sales, uh, printed uh, some of his books with Valentine, thinking that that might help words with own sales. If you're like, mm. you know, this book must be so beautifully printed, Let, let's take something from this Mr. Wordsworth and see if it helps sell some of our own, as it were. Yes. So, a wonderful success. We don't have a first edition, so as well as the, the, the Jane Austens, if anybody has a spare one of these, that would be, that would be very nice too. I'll stop at this point. I could go on all night with that. That will get tedious, sorry. This is such a, I, I, I mean, we should perhaps apologise in the sense this has been so fascinating and such a treat. We've kind of worked through our tea break, but I'm sure people will forgive us uh, for that and we'll just push on. Maybe, Jeff, we could finish this part just by having a look at what's probably um, the most famous book published in the period in the mm. general imagination, which is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And then we've had a couple of fascinating questions on the literary culture as well, which we, um, which we, which we could deal with at this point. Um, but I think here, yeah, so here we've got a uh, first edition of, of, of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or wow. the modern Prometheus, about which wow. you write very interestingly, Robert. So perhaps I could just hand over to you. Well, I, uh, I think I've been teaching in universities, British and Canadian, for, you know, close to 30 years. I don't know how many semesters I've not taught Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein, um, I, I think, lives in the popular imagination and as a... As a as a, a as a piece of thought provoking uh, literature, I, I I I come back to it over and over again. In in fact, when I when I finished the book and you know the publisher had a very strict uh, word limit, and so I had to you know I had to go through this gruesome business of of removing. And one of the things that I realized was that every chapter contained a long description of why Frankenstein mattered politically, and then in terms of entertainment, and then in terms of sex. And so I decided that the perhaps the better approach was just to end with Frankenstein, because in, in, in many ways, for me, as I saw the Regency, it all, not all, but a great deal of it can be seen as ebbing toward what Mary Shelley does in Frankenstein. It was a dreary night of November, yes. What Mary Shelley does in Frankenstein in 1818. Uh, and um, uh, I, I just found that in terms of uh, her, her, her portrayal of uh, everything from you know, uh, creation and creativity to uh, uh, to science, to uh, uh, parenthood, <laughs> to wandering, as we've already discussed, and the violence, the sexual violence in that novel. Um, it it just makes it um, impossible to get around 
and the the fact that uh, 200 years, uh, you know, the, I would say the only novel that rivals it in the po popular imagination is Pride and Prejudice as a product of the Regency. But I think it is the most famous text of the Regency. And one of the things that I really wanted to do in this book, as much as I could, was to make sure that women weren't left out. I really wanted the actresses and I really wanted the, the, the scientists and the women who shaped that age and it was um it was a really positive thing for me that uh, uh shelley and jane Aust mary shelley and jane austen uh kept kept giving uh kept, over and over again uh uh in their novels and their letters um showed how central they were to the period and how deeply they understood it how deeply they understood what was happening around them uh, i hope that one of the things the book does is is demonstrate uh, what uh, a resilient and, and creative and insightful women both of them were. When you think, for example, that Austen's last two novels published posthumously have 1818 on the title page, uh, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein has 1818 on the title page, that means Northanger Abbey, Persuasion, and Frankenstein come out with a, within about 100 days of one another. And it was those collisions that made my head spin. And I thought, I've got to see if I can write a book in which I put these texts into dialogue with one another. Because as I tried to make the point with excursion, it does seem to me that at, at a fundamental level, there are ways in which they are speaking to one another. Even if it's speaking in anger, they're still speaking to one another. Thank you, Robert. I mean, there's a, there's a number of um, comments now that are just capturing the excitement around this extraordinary period. So Carol Thurlaway here is saying, looking forward to reading your book, uh, Robert. And Margaret Thorpe makes the interesting point that you know, Scott not allowing his name to appear, so he's just the author yes. of Waverley, adds yes. to the excitement and, and the sales. Uh, someone yes. else talking about how much they like Hazlitt's essays. I've got two, yes. two kind of related questions that I might give you together. Um, one of which is from Michael Reardon, who, who just asks, who would be the reading audience of the Regency? Mm. And the other one is, I know, is from our, our, our good friend Anthony Harding, who... Um, um, and I know this will be of particular interest to you given your work in the past. Um, he wants to ask you, oh, sorry, the, we, we, we just, I just lost it there. He wants to ask um, whether you feel that more important than any single book, such as Waverly or Emma, are the periodicals, mm. especially mm. the Examiner, Cobbett's Political Register, the Courier, which Coleridge wrote for, and of course the Quarterly, Edinburgh and Blackwood. So the reading public and then the role of periodicals in the period. Well, the reading public, um, what I found, uh, I found quite a few descriptions, only I think two of them made it into the book, but there are a lot of people who can't read or who can't read very well. And so there are reading clubs and reading societies, even, you know, a long way down the social hierarchies. And if one person can read in a pub, for example, or in a home or on a stagecoach or wherever it is, then there were lots of people who got that knowledge, um, got the experience of reading, for example, a Scott uh, novel or a Byron poem, because it was a very social activity. So uh, when Walter Scott's Waverly comes out, Austin knows right away it's Walter Scott. And she says he has no business taking the bread out of other people's mouth. And she says, wonderfully, uh, you know, I'm determined not to like Waverly, but I fear I must. In other words, she knows it's Scott right away. And of course, part of her is a little bit, I think, irritated that Mansfield Park comes out and then all of a sudden <laughs> there's this sensation with Scott's novel, a very different uh, uh, novel than, than uh, Mansfield Park. So the reading audience, who's reading it? You know, people who are buying it, Werther's poems, very expensive, very expensive for the time. And so not very many people can buy it. But um, maybe not as much in the case of Wordsworth, but a, a, a Lord Byron or a Walter Scott, it's not, uh, uh, in, in, in my understanding of it, it's not who's reading it as much as who's in a circle where they can hear it. And so lots of times people gain a knowledge of, for example, Lord Byron or who he is or what he did, or what he said, or what he wrote, based not on their reading, but on their, on their listening. And so, you know, figuring out the reading audience is a, you know, you don't you don't spend much time in English literature before you go, well, I better not, <laughs> I better not say I know who was reading what because I don't. But what I do know is that, for example, the Edgeworth household, all those children and 
father sat around reading Waverly. And Mariah Edgeworth writes to Scott and says, I cannot tell you the grip it had on us all. And so that sense in which the, you know, literature, you know, I mean, I love the period because, because, you know, Byron is a poet, major poet. Today he's a major poet. And he's the most popular person of the day. It's a very, it's a very uh, 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 inspirational moment. And Scott is incredibly popular as well. And these novels reach a very broad audience, often not because they've been read, but because they've been uh, listened to. And uh, so I'll move now to the periodicals. Hi, Anthony. It's very nice to hear from you. Anthony Harding is a great uh, Coleridge uh, scholar and uh, has been a very good friend of mine for many years. And I think, Anthony, you'll be in Nova Scotia, where I used to live. So hi, Anthony. Um, so yes, uh, one of the things that I've worked on quite a bit is Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, which, of course, Wordsworth hated and wouldn't let in his house. But another Lake District figure, John Wilson, who lived at LRA just down the road, from Dove Cottage was uh, uh, the guiding light of uh, Blackwood's Magazine. And Blackwood's Magazine exploded onto the literary scene, as we all know, in October 1817. And its ability to shift public opinion and the, 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 the size of the readership and the controversy it generated. Um, uh, yes, I think Anthony's right. There's a tremendous role that the reviews play. So for example, Lee Hunt, um, you know, flails the regent and people go, you better be, you better calm down, Lee, because he's going to get irritated. And all Hunt is doing is telling the truth. He's speaking truth to power in a very brave way. And Hunt, of course, as we know, ends up in prison for two years because he dared to say the regent was fat and not very reliable and, you know, head over heels and debt and all the rest of it. So it gives you a sense uh, when Walter Scott reviews uh, uh, Emma in uh, the quarterly these, these journals have tremendous weight in shaping public opinion. So when Hazlitt gets attacked in the quarterly for his essays, you, you know, as, as far as we can tell, it destroys the sales because uh, the Quincy assassination on everybody's battening on the quarterly in the Edinburgh and nobody's thinking for themselves anymore. Um, he's speaking, his, his complaint speaks to the power of those organs. And it is, it is an exciting dynamic part of the Regency that Blackwood's magazine is coming out swinging from the right every month. You know, the quarterly, the Edinburgh, the quarterly come out four times a year, whereas Blackwood changes everything in the Regency because it comes out every month, and that produces the London magazine and so on. So, yes, the, the periodicals play a really dynamic, interesting uh, role. And this is one of the, uh, the the magazines, if you like, that you mention a lot in your, in your book, Rob, and uh, I think it's just one of our well, it's one of the things that, that gives great pleasure, uh, the, the examiner. I mean, just the size of it, this, is, this I guess, is, is, a, is a year's worth, as it were. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a lovely, and, and this, this isn't uh, generously printed. This is, this no. is tightly printed, isn't it? Tightly printed. But yeah. uh, I, you know, I, when I began, uh, you know, you, you go in knowing a little bit more about some people than other people. Lee Hunt is someone that I've worked on uh, quite a bit, although the, the later Lee Hunt, but he's also someone as a as a as a journalist and as a as a familiar essayist and uh, even as a poet um, that I really really admire. And it was a great opportunity for me to take work I'd done on Lee Hunt and work I'd done in Jane Austen and work I'd done in Blackwood Magazine, and try to you know try to see how they were speaking to one another, how they were in dialogue, and what they were fighting over. And so that was a that was an opportunity to think more about Lee Hunt. And of course, the you know, the Prince Regent uh, bought Austin's novels, and he also saw it, that Lee Hunt was put in prison for two years for calling him fat. Well, yeah. he was fat. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're talking he, about essays, fat. and um, that, that naturally brings us to uh, an essayist living uh, in, in the cottage, um, and a manuscript that uh, you, you know well, um, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I looked at that a lot. So if you'd like to say a little bit about this, if you would, please. Well, I'll just back up a little bit to say that I was uh, in, in Oxford in the mid-1980s, and Jonathan uh, Wordsworth is my tutor, and I was working on De Quincey, or at least I was trying to think about maybe working on De Quincey and uh, flailing about rather a lot. And I was walking through the quad one morning and Jonathan came bustling out of his office 
and told me that the manuscript of Confessions of an English Open Meter had been found in, I think, Jeff, I'm right in saying a British rail boot sale or something like that. A, a, a British rail pensions uh, fund. Right, a British rail pension fund. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Um, because it was the work that I thought, well, I'll write my, my thesis on this and maybe I'll work on Thomas Quincy. And, uh, and so um, uh, as soon as it was, as soon as Dove Cottage acquired it and uh, 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 was in the collection, I climbed on a train and went to the Lake District. And I remember meeting Robert Wolf, who was very, very excited about it. And he took me and he sat me down and I looked at that manuscript. And I can remember thinking, this is just, you know, I'm going to spend my life in English literature. This is just so uh, so exciting uh, and uh, when I see it now I have to tell you that even though I'm in Canada I feel the same excitement Jeff and I had a had a really good talk I don't know if you remember Jeff a little while ago and my recollection of it is that you said something like well what's so exciting about a manuscript like help and of course you know but you, you said you know is there a phrase and I said the thing that's exciting for me about manuscripts is you get to see the mind in motion and yeah. so when I look at that, I see De Quincey writing one thing and crossing it out and writing something else. And of course, I'm really interested in what he's crossing out. <laughs> For me, looking at a manuscript is not what's in the manuscript. What's, what's uh, uh, been taken out, what De Quincey decided he didn't want to say is often as revealing as what he went on to say. And uh, that manuscript, I've spent, I've spent a lot of time <laughs> with that manuscript and always with uh, the same excitement that I felt on first seeing it. It's one of the great prose works of the 19th century, I think. And, and uh, as you said earlier, next year is a bicentenary of De Quincey's Confessions. It came out in September and October 1821. De Quincey sent that manuscript to uh, Taylor and Hesse in London, and they printed the first part of Confessions. And so we're doing a, a, an issue and maybe a conference or something to celebrate the 200 years of the publication of that, uh, that text. And it is, you can just look at it. I, I, I just think it's a fascinating, um, fascinating manuscript. Maybe a question for the chat box is to invite people to speculate what the brown stains might be on the, on the manuscript. <laughs> well, De Quincey was, as you know, De Quincey was in the habit of apologizing uh, to publishers because that's, you know, I'm sorry, sorry, you can't read that very well. I just spilled my laudanum on it. Um, <laughs> now, I would love to know if that is in fact laudanum or it's tea. Because as you know, he speaks about having both on his desk in Dove, uh, Dove Cottage. He probably wrote that in London rather than Dove Cottage. And there is, of course, a second part. That's the part that was published in September 1821. Um, it would be wonderful if Dove Cottage got a first edition of Jane Austen's novels. It would also be wonderful if somebody had another sale and reopened it up at Pension Fund and we found the second part of Confessions. I think at that point I would just move to Grasmere. <laughs> would, would it would it spoil it for you to know what the brown stains really are, or would you like that to remain a mystery? A bit like should you ever have come to Lancaster? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I'm interested in everything about the Quincy, so I suppose I I I uh, I would like to know. Um, well, but I can in tell a way, you, I can tell you. Yeah. I can actually tell you because. Well, can you? Oh, oh please do, please do. I bet it, uh, before yeah. you tell me, before you tell me, I bet it's not opium. You might be right about that. Really? Um, oh, good. Oh, good. One, one of my early things when I, when I, you know, in my first decade here, um, right. I was invited to take this to a top secret military establishment, better known for CND marches. And uh, <laughs> after, after having gone through several gates worth of security, um, we got to the point and the, the scientist I met said, well, the only way we can test this um, is if we dribble some water over them. I maybe shouldn't be saying this, actually, in front of 60 people. You're stopping my heart, Jeff. You're yeah. stopping my heart. Um, so anyway, it's, it stopped my heart. So what, yes. what did I do? And uh, I, he said, well, it would just be down the, down the gutter of the book, and it'll just take, you know, it won't, it won't be much. So we went ahead with it, and they did right. the test. And I still have a job, so clearly it didn't all wash off. But that was my fear. The other thing was going to wash off. Yes. Um, anyway, it's coffee. Is it? It's coffee. It's coffee. I mean, that's not what the auction catalogue suggested it might be, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> yeah. That would have added a few thousand pounds more had it, you know, had it been opium. But uh, that was the speculation. Wow. Okay, anyway. well, he's, De Quincey says to, uh, to uh, the editor of the London magazine, John Taylor, 
that he is writing parts of it. He's, you know, he's still, uh, uh, he's horrendously in debt all the time, uh, as we know. And in 1821, he's writing really to get himself out of debt, which of course he's never able to do. Uh, he says that he writes parts of it in uh, London coffee houses. So maybe he's telling us the truth. Maybe he was in London. Not that you couldn't get opium in London coffee houses, but maybe he's telling us the truth. So Robert, one of our um, uh, uh, participants, Geronimo Ledesma, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who joins us from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So thanks very much for joining us, uh, Geronimo. He, he points out that the opening opium dream, the Oriental dream passages are dated May 1818, which obviously yes. is what helps this get into your tight um, category. Um, yes. And, and as you say, most of it is written in is London, as far as we know, isn't it? Rather than rather than Grasmere. Mm. But it, it is a story which gives us um, some fascinating sort of uh, occurrences which are happening in Grasmere uh, during the Regency period, as witnessed and involving uh, De Quincey. Can you can you tell us about those? Sure. I, I want to say hi to Geronimo, who's uh, been. I've had lovely correspondences with uh, Geronimo. So thank you for joining us. Uh, um, so yes, the, the, the scene that De Quincey uh, sets in Grasmere, in Dove Cottage, paint me a, a picture reader, picture if you will, um, that's not in the first installment, that's not in the manuscript that we have. But the most remarkable moment for me, just to take us back to 1812 for a moment, is that shortly after Spencer Percival is assassinated, um, uh, 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 Catherine Wordsworth, Wordsworth's young daughter, Mary and William's young daughter, dies. And De Quincey, as many of the audience will know, was very, very closely attached to this young girl, and he was uh, devastated. And um, uh, uh, Dorothy writes him, and De Quincey is beside himself with grief. And uh, um, when Henry Crabbe Robinson sees Wordsworth and De Quincey together, Crabbe Robinson says, uh, De Quincey seemed more upset than the father. Um, so there's, I think, a performative aspect to it. There are a variety of other things going on. But when De Quincey comes back to Grasmere, he claims, not in Confessions but elsewhere, that he sleeps on Catherine's grave from between six and eight weeks, that every night, so every time I go to that Grasmere churchyard and I see Catherine's grave, I think, I wonder if Thomas De Quincey lay on that grave uh, for six or eight weeks uh, after Catherine's um, death. And De Quincey says in Confessions that this is the moment when he can no longer handle the, the accumulating griefs of his life. And he becomes, in 1813, a regular and confirmed opium addict. And one of the most remarkable uh, 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 moments in Confessions is set in Dove Cottage and is called, as Geronimo and many others will know, is called um, the Easter Sunday Dream, or at least it's known as the Easter Sunday Dream. And it's July 1819. And of course, when you're me and you decide you're going to write a a book on the Regency, and you see June 1819, you go, yes, yes, I get to talk about the Easter Sunday dream, which is said in Dove Cottage in De Quincey on Easter Sunday. And, you know, De Quincey talks about um, how, how, how he hopes that all Greece will die away and he will find some sort of um, solace and comfort. And he comes out of the gate of Dove Cottage. And when you have that dream in your head, it's very difficult to come out of the gate of Dove Cottage and not see the landscape, which sort of looks, you know, as it does uh, uh, in Wordsworth Day, and then transform, it's transformed into an Oriental landscape. And it's in that landscape uh, uh, that uh, it transforms again, and he's walking down the streets of London, and he meets Anne of Oxford Street, uh, the prostitute who was a surrogate for all kinds of lost women um, in De Quincey. So for, for me, the great moment of De Quincey's um, uh, uh, experience in Dove Cottage in terms of confessions is the Easter Sunday dream of June 18, uh, 19. It is, I'm just going to add one more thing quickly, Simon, which is when I realized that De Quincey became an opium addict and Jane Austen published Pride and Prejudice in the same year, 1813, I thought, you know, rock and roll. This, this is, <laughs> this is, this is, what I want to talk, I want to write a book that makes sure it goes to De Quincey's addiction and Austen's love story within the same within the same trajectory and that's that's the kind of thing i was after that kind of collision we don't necessarily think of de quincey uh, 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 as an addict and austin as a novelist you know almost exactly coinciding but they do 
I think that is one of the great things about the book is those those collisions, those juxtapositions, which even sort of structure things like London, as you show, you know, the the, the kind of the posh side and the and the, the impoverished side. And one of the things the book does yeah. really nicely is to is to bring those different parts of the age together. Uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think Thank we've you. got time for probably one more um, question before we ask you to to just read us a, a passage from the book right. to, to finish off. But it's another question from Geronimo actually. Um, uh, just because it, I mean, one of the one of the striking things about the book again is, you know, it's not just about Britain. This book, it is about sort of, uh, it is global um, in its outlook. And um, you know, Geronimo's asked if you considered the sort of in any way the relation between the usual European periodization, which of course is structured by the Battle of Waterloo. Um, yeah. You know, so you normally have the Napoleonic Wars or the Revolutionary Period. Waterloo in 1815, and then the yeah. Restoration. Um, you know, if you thought about the relationship between that and the Regency as this kind of 10 year period, which again, yeah. as you said before, with remarkable symmetry, sort of sits either side of that great, well, that world historical event. Yeah, uh, that's an excellent uh, uh, question, Geronimo. And uh, what, what became clear quite early on, I mean, the, the, the North American publisher was Norton, and I was thrilled to get Norton because Norton said, you know, we'll get you in the New York Times, you'll be in the Wall Street Journal, we will, we will push this book out. You'll join and, the words of trust. Yeah. <laughs> all <laughs> that's these the, things. That's the big all, one. <laughs> all these things. All these things. And, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, Simon, what uh, print run often is on an academic yeah. book, and you work very, very, very hard on that book. And, uh, you know, you think that maybe you've said some interesting things and uh, uh, the, the, the print run is, you know, is sort of a little bit hard on the head. And so the, uh, a trade publisher is going gonna, is gonna to push it out further, but they say it's a certain length and you don't even in your wildest dreams think about asking us to go nine words over that because that is not going to happen. It's going to come in on time. And so I think earlier, if I read the chat quickly enough, someone asked about translations. And translations was a was a was a paradox, and it it got cut because I thought I can't be talking about Goethe. Uh, 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 I mean, there's one quotation from uh, Goethe, but I wished I'd been able to do a, a lot more. And one of the things is the is the the regency and how that sits again in, in exactly the way that Geronimo has said. And so the answer is yes, I did, and I didn't have room. And I, I worry that sounds like a bit of a a cop out, but um, I, 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 I'm old enough now that I want to write something that somebody reads <laughs> and I want more than one review. Uh, and, uh, I, I've, you know, I, 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 I love publishing with academic presses. It's been a very important part of my career, but I, I, I really believe in English literature. I really believe in the importance of poetry and especially a poet like Wordsworth. And I really want English literature to, to reach a broader uh, 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 audience, and so I, 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 I did my best to take in as much as I could, but it had to be rooted in Britain, or, or I got myself in trouble. So it is global, but that's because Britain's all around the globe, and so it became a way of saying, okay, that's really interesting. I, 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 I can't do that. I don't have room. Or more often than not. I did it, and now I got to cut it. <laughs> I spent, you know, I spent three weeks getting that right, and now I got to cut it. Can I kind of say that Simon and I had exactly the same experience when we worked together on the new museum at Grasmere? Um, right. The similar thing is, it's one thing people to enjoy and get to know the literature, but it's also realizing you can't say everything, and uh, that that's quite a discipline, isn't it, to do that? But I, I found it. I, I I mean, you know, when you when you, it's like when I go. Uh, um, you know, like antiquarian book shopping. I never remember. I never remember the books I bought. I always think, oh, why didn't I? Why didn't I buy that first edition of Godwin in Oxford in 1985, like I should have done? Uh, and uh, you know, when you finish the book and you cut, you think, oh my God, I took out that long thing about persuasion, Austin's persuasion, for example. Um, but it is. It it there, there's a real virtue in it. At least I found for what I was doing a real virtue. It made me go what's important. And I really tried to make sure it wasn't all about Byron and Austin and Napoleon. 
I tried to make sure that, you know, Dorothea Jordan made it in and Elizabeth Fry made it in and, uh, you know, uh, uh, indigenous people like Ben Along uh, uh, in Australia and like Tecumseh in Canada, uh, you, you know, were part of that narrative. I didn't want it to be a book about London, Brighton and Bath. I really wanted it to be a book with a, with a global outlook. Well, when, when, when one does an exhibition, one, one's always imagining that the visitors will come along and say, why didn't you include that picture? Or why didn't you include that book? And, and I guess that's a similar thing. And, and it is. have to be made, don't they? One thing I'm really pleased you, you did include um, was in the globalization about the Arctic. And you mentioned uh, Sir John Richardson. And you yes. may or may not remember, but in Grasmere Church, um, there, there is a plaque, Sir John Richardson, constant companion of Sir John Franklin, an Arctic explorer, born at Dumfries, died at Grasmere, uh, 1865. So that's another very nice link with the wider I world. Did not, I did not know that. I did not know that, Jeff. And one of the things I discovered after I finished the book was that another Arctic explorer, uh, William Edward Perry, went to the same grammar school in Bath that De Quincey did. Huh. And um, yeah, well, I, I live, well, I'm meant to be living in Bath. I hope I'm back in Bath uh, soon. And I walk every evening by Bath Grammar School. And uh, it's also, uh, it's the Quincy School, but it was also uh, William Edward Perry, who's a great explorer with, uh, 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 on the Franklin, you know, at the same time as Sir John Franklin. Mm. Yeah. So Robert, could, could, before we sort of thank you for what's been a fantastic evening, uh, could we ask you just to read a short extract um, from sure. your book to, um, give our attendees a sense of um, you know, the, 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 the treat that is ahead of them if, they, if Santa <laughs> brings this for them uh, on Christmas Day. Um, uh, yes, I'm very happy to do that. What I've, what I've decided to do is just uh, take the last two paragraphs of the book. Um, and uh, I've, I've spent, the, this is from the conclusion, I've spent part of the conclusion saying, you know, the Prince Regent was a pretty paradoxical guy, dreadful politically. <laughs> And personally, uh, there are some redeeming features to his character. And then I try to turn and in the last two paragraphs, just reprise the people and the events that uh, have been a part of the book. And so I'll just read, uh, I'll just read you that. And this is, this is uh, uh, when I put this list together, essentially, before I started writing this book, I was, I was amazed at, at, at the sort of roll call of names. And I hope it doesn't sound like a, a roll call. But here are some of the topics the book covers. During the Regency, John Nash planned and oversaw the construction of Regent's Park and Regent's Street. With the invention of the miner's safety lamp, Sir Humphrey Davy and Michael Faraday demonstrated the powers of science to improve the human condition. Charles Babbage was the first to imagine what would eventually become the modern computer. David Brewster invented the kaleidoscope the instant and immense popularity which revealed the burgeoning powers of consumerism, while Luddites protested business practices that brought soaring profits to factory owners and low-wage dead-end misery to workers. John Clare was among the first environmental activists, and he wrote compellingly of the intricate interrelationship between the human and the non-human worlds. Further, Pierce Egan established modern sports journalism, Robert Owen pioneered socialist thought. Percy Shelley championed secularism. Elizabeth Fry demanded the more humane treatment of prisoners. Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Thomas De Quincey were the first to detail the transient intellectual pleasure and the vicious cycles of bodily pain brought on by opiate addiction. Anne Lister described her joyous experiences of same-sex love while William Beckford and Jeremy Bentham wrote on the barbarity of, publish, of punishing people for their sexual preferences. Bo Brummel made fashion statements that uh, still influence the way men dress. Edmund Keane and Lord Byron were the first modern celebrities. Thomas Lawrence and Henry Rayburn painted the glamorous portraits that have made the Regency a byword for beauty and poise. John Constable produced timeless versions of rural England J.M.W. Turner revolutionized British landscape art. Jane Austen wrote Pride and Prejudice, the most popular love story of the last two centuries, while Mary Shelley produced Frankenstein and John Polidori created The Vampire, the two most potent horror myths of the modern age. Almost two centuries ago, 
the aston uh, almost two centuries ago, the glittering world of the Regency seemed to Lord Byron to disappear with astonishing quickness. Now it is more evident than ever that its many legacies are still all around us. The end. Well, not quite. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, that was just amazing. Robert, just, it just kind of leaves um, a moment for us to say thank you. That's why it's not just quite the end. Um, because that's been a tremendous evening. Uh, we, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. The time's flown by. There's so many more questions that, that we would love to talk over with you. Um, we you talk about collisions. That's the word you used. Um, it's the collisions of the, of, the, of the years that you talk about, the, the reading in context. But there's also the collisions in your book, if you like, between the global and the local. So we, we just mm -hmm. kind of looked at from the famous, as it were, waking up famous, but also to all the many underrepresented people that you, you, you bring to our attention. Um, there's, the, there's the horror that we talked about for, for, for your sexuality, the crime, as it were, of your sexuality, to the humour. We didn't talk about the pie-eating contests or the ridiculous betting competitions that, that took place. Yeah. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity, too, that you brought us to look at the original books, the original manuscript, mm -hmm. and to hear your excitement about them. That, that's a real treat in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, your personal anecdotes have added a richness to it. Um, <laughs> questions about Lancaster and, and the should you have bought that Godwin or not? I feel that probably was a real moment in your life. That that point about the it Godwin. was it yeah. was the first first edition I'd held, and uh, it was for twenty eight quid, and <laughs> I, I didn't buy it, and I I I, uh, I don't know what happened, and I you know I went back two days later, and of course it was gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh well. Everybody remembers the book they didn't buy. That's the book I didn't buy. Twenty-eight quid. So it's been a, it's been a great evening, and and to thank you also for the many years of great evenings. We saw one earlier on with the launch of the De Quincey book. You've been a great friend to us over the many years. Um. So for that and for tonight particularly, thank you. Um. Jeff, I, I have to say that my life was changed uh, uh, in, in a really, what's turned out to be fabulous way by coming to the Wordsworth Conference uh, in 1983. And uh, I was uh, in the Red Lion Hotel and I stepped out to the phone box and I phoned my mom in Lethbridge, Alberta, uh, you know, which is a long way away by the Rocky Mountains. And I said, mom, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to become an English prof. And I'd never thought of it before I came to that conference in 1983 and my mother burst into tears <laughs> she thought well thank goodness thank goodness Seth Robert's gonna be okay he's got, he's got something he's passionate about and I, I I owe the words with trust all of that so I'm I'm deeply honored to have been asked and uh, I really appreciate you know talking to you and to Simon and all the great questions and and being here thank you very very much that's our pleasure there's a chance we might meet together next September if that symposium takes place in Grasmere um I hope so Confessions. That, that's something we, we hope we might be able to work towards. Uh, in the meantime, um, in, a, in a week's time, uh, this is our next event. Oh, good, uh, this good. is uh, Psycho Yoshikawa. We're going to be talking about William Wordsworth and modern travel. And this is a great book, too. This is, this is fantastic, though. Um, it's full of wonderful histories about, for example, about railways that could have been built in the Lake District but, but weren't. Um, so it's, it's, if, you, if you know any railway historians, for example, they should join <laughs> in well, because it's absolutely fascinating about the possibilities of lines over or through Dunmail Rays. So, so please do join us uh, for that next week. And then the week after that, the final one of our series, uh, we'll be looking at Words with Guide to the Lakes in real detail, uh, the writing of it and the contents of it. So two more, two more really, really good events. I'm going to end by thanking Hannah. Uh, Hannah, who just keeps the show on the road and keeps Simon and I it gives us great confidence that everything's going to be all right. And then particularly this week, Hannah, th thank you very much for your help. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Thank you to everybody who's made a comment, everybody who's asked a question. Uh, and again, once again, thank you, Rob. And uh, hope to see you all uh, again in a week's time. I'll say good night. I'll do the, I'll do the Zoom wave. <laughs> Bye from Ontario. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye, Rob. <laughs>